Welcome back to Sociology 101, the show that was predestined to happen. And with us today is Dr. Brian Wagner, a professor of theology and biblical languages at Veritas Baptist College. And uh, you know Brian, he's been on before. We're having a little bit of internet connection, so we're praying that uh, he will come through strong. But uh, Brian, welcome back to the program. Hey Amen. Thank you, Leighton, for the invitation to come back and uh, looking forward to our discussion of, of various scriptures. And uh, hey, it's all predestined, so... Yeah, <laughs> exactly. We'll see. We'll see what happens. As I, had a guy up, oh, I had a guy ahead, yesterday. Hey, I had a guy yesterday who actually was trying to push super determinism, and and I, you know, talked with him for briefly, and then I said, I, you know, there's nothing more for me to share, and then he 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 um, said I wasn't letting him finish. You know, <laughs> I said, well, you're not predestined to finish. <laughs> yeah, I guess not. I guess not. Well, and it, 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 we do speak tongue, tongue in cheek on some of that, but we do also know that um, when, when you hold to um, um, uh, what Tim Stratton has called EDD, exhausted divine determinism, the concept and idea that God has decreed whatsoever comes to pass, every molecule, as R.C. Sproul talks about it, is uh, is determined ultimately to move as exactly as God has governed it to move. The wills and thoughts of men, even Calvin says, have been governed by God uh, or governed by God. Um, and so obviously there are various non-Calvinistic uh, theological and philosophical perspectives out there. Um, there are ways in which we deal with these various uh, perspectives. But what I wanted to do as we begin this program is to have someone who is you know versed in the languages uh, and in theology to come on and let me just kind of interview you about the passages of Scripture that are most commonly referenced to support the concept of divine determinism, uh, the Calvinistic concepts of divine determinism as promoted by well-known scholars like Jonathan Edwards and later, of course, today, John Piper uh, supports uh, Edwards' perspectives on divine determinism. I know there are some Calvinists out there like Greg Kokel, uh, Crisp, who deny divine determinism, and and they do hold to more of a libertarian perspective, very inconsistently uh, in my estimation, but and it's and it's also rare in in my experience. But there are some Calvinists. I'm just making the caveat: there are some Calvinists who do not deny theistic determinism that God determines every uh, everything. But that's not the common view of of John Calvin and leading Calvinistic scholars. And the way in which, at least uh, confessionally, the Calvinists have supported their idea of a sovereign divine decree that brings about all things is through some, some very popular proof texts that they, they refer to. And I asked Brian, what are those m most common proof texts? And he did a little research and he came up with, we're going to pick four of the most common proof texts used to support divine determinism, uh, theistic determinism. And, and we're just going to go through those and talk through them and take questions from the audience, possibly, as time allows. Um, and, uh, and, and so that this, that's the purpose of this program is to examine the text for what they say and say, do they say enough to support this concept of theistic determinism? Um, as is scrolling on the bottom of the screen, uh, just to remind you, if you can support this ministry, we'd greatly appreciate it. If you're looking for a higher theological education, you can you can consider Veritas Baptist College, where uh, Brian is, but uh, you can also consider where I'm, I'm teaching at Trinity Theological uh, Seminary, and uh, and we, we would highly recommend that and, and appreciate those who give and support this ministry on a regular basis. The, one of the best ways you can support is to like and subscribe to this channel and share it on your own social media pages. I'd appreciate you doing that. Brian does that quite regularly, and he, he participates on our Facebook page uh, as one of the scholars in residence, so to speak, to uh, help to engage with some of those conversations that I always appreciate. Don't always agree with him, and he doesn't always agree with me, believe it or not, but uh, <laughs> we, we love each other, and we agree on a lot of things, and so that that's a, that, that, that's a, a thing that we try to remind each other of. Oh, and, and let me remind you also, download the app from ridgemax.co uh, and leave a five-star review on that app. That always helps as well. So, all right, Brian, let's dive right in. What is the most popular passage in your estimation or the one probably most referenced with regard to theistic determinism? So let me just comment first. Uh, we agree on provisionism. So uh, and that, yes. that is the key, uh, the P-R-O-V-I-D-E <laughs> anachronism. Uh, and the verses that go along with it are clearly uh, in support of each of those points. And so, yeah. And then let me also say, 
uh, as far as getting these verses, I, I put the challenge out there a couple times on Facebook. Um, I'll give $100 to someone who can give me a very clear verse. I usually say that uses the word decree because that is theologically the word that they use. But I know they can argue, well, the word Trinity is not in the Bible either. But even if you don't find a verse that has the word decree in it, the idea of something that God did before creation, predestining everything to work out only one way. So, so where is this verse? Where, where are these verses that, that are foundational, really? They're foundational to, to um, I say, to Calvinism, Arminianism, and Molinism, because they all teach the idea of a divine decree that that God creates a world and, and that decree sets in motion the way everything is going to work out. Hmm. Um, and God knows it. They all have different views of how God knows it, but but they basically have that foundational idea of a decree. So yeah. I got these verses from answering that question, <laughs> that challenge. Okay. I, I haven't had to pay, I haven't had paid out the uh, hundred dollars <laughs> yet, thankfully. Um, <laughs> but I was I was pretty pretty confident that there wasn't any such verse. And again, uh, and Brian, you're cutting out on us a little bit, so I'm going to interject because it usually just kind of cycles, and he'll come back uh, in in just a second. So, uh, unfortunately, that's just the internet the way it works sometimes, and so he's kind of frozen up. But um, yeah. the fr yeah, the first passage that that Brian yeah. is going to have to, have. Uh, to reference is out of Isaiah 46. Um, and so, out of Isaiah 46, let's put that up on the screen. And I think Brian, you're back with us now. You're, at least you're moving again. Yeah, so, that's that's good. Just uh, jump in there when we lock up. And I'm sorry about that. Okay. I, I guess it's me, um, uh, but I, I'm hope hopefully the Lord will keep this working. Uh, but yes, Isaiah 46:10 is usually the verse I get the most, or I see the most, from those who are trying to prove that God has predestined everything before creation to work out only one way. And so when we read this verse, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. And right away, the word decree, of course, is in there. Mm -hmm. And the idea of declaring, okay, maybe you can say declaring a decree, okay? But it says the end from the beginning, not before the beginning. So there's mm -hmm. nothing in the verse that says God made a declaration before creation. It says from the beginning. Now, you could say it still keeps the door open, that the declaration could have made, been made also before creation. But this verse doesn't teach that. It teaches from the beginning. In fact, it even parallels the idea of what from the beginning means by saying from ancient times. Mm -hmm. So the declaring is going on before Isaiah is, is giving a prediction about the Babylonian captivity and so forth. And he's saying, look, your idols can't do this. God can do this. God can tell you before, ahead of time things that, that will be the end and, and mm -hmm. from his beginning of that plan to bring about that end, he, right. he can he can tell you, and nothing's yeah. going to stop that from happening. But I always like to give you know a, like the benefit of the doubt, like just to say, okay, let's just pretend that Calvinists are right, and it's not from the beginning; it's actually before the beginning, which we know the SV actually makes a, a translation error from Revelation. I think you've pointed that out before. Thirteen with, eight with 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 pra and apa. Is that correct? Yes, uh, if I remember. Uh, and, and translating it as from, uh, they should have said from the beginning, but they say before the beginning, um, because there is a distinction there. But let's let's just give them let's let's concede that point, and then ask the question: Would this verse be supporting the claim of a theistic determinist if it did say before the beginning of creation? In other words, declaring the end from before the foundation of the world. Would that be enough to support the claim of a Calvinist? And so to answer that, we'll get into the weeds just a little bit here. The word the end uh, in the Hebrew doesn't have the definite article on this word end. So it could be an end. 
he declares an end from or before let gets to your word before the beginning right. right right and so so it's only talking about an outcome it's not talking about every outcome right the an end but not everything in between the beginning and the end <laughs> is declared <laughs> just the end right. is declared and and also if it's the end if we if we take the normal translation there and, and make it a definite uh event that's that's in mind in isaiah's mind uh we can we can say sure god has a certain end for creation that he has in mind that he is going to bring about yeah and in fact enoch in the beginning <laughs> enoch prophesied of that coming end where where the lord comes to earth with all his saints and all his angels and, and sets up his his uh, final dominion here right and so some people get the false impression that we as non-calvinist or non-determinist so to speak don't believe that god d determines anything like god just has no determinative power and free will thwarts his will or th things just ridiculous statements like that and that's just not that's just not true we do exactly. believe in a, we have a very high view of providence God is actively at work bringing about his purpose and his, his plans within the world. He does determine some things, and he is certain to bring those things about because nobody can thwart the, the sovereign will of God. Nobody's bigger than or more powerful than him, like the old chessboard analogy that we've used. I know that everybody's probably aware of, but when you have a, a person playing both sides of the chessboard in order to ensure his victory, that's much less impressive, at least as far as I can tell, than someone who's actually taking on real opponents and beating them handedly just because he's so much better at chess than they are. And so you can say before the chess match begins or before a thousand chess matches begin, you can say he will be victorious. The end is declared before it actually begins. The, the I'm going to checkmate your king. Begins. Exactly. <laughs> and he can, he can either, he can either declare that make known that because he knows it beforehand and, or because he's so powerful that you, you can trust the fact that he's going to beat any opponent that comes against him because of his power and his ability. But you don't have to say the only way he can declare the end, his victory, from before the beginning is because he meticulously determines every move his opponent makes and every thought, action, and deed of every creature, every molecule, every, there's no rogue molecule, there's no, no, everything has to be meticulously scripted in order for him to declare the end from the beginning because that's the only way in our finite mind we can imagine him accomplishing that purpose is by ultimately determining everything that happens. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So so the the end can be set and all the moves in between he has freedom and he allows man to have freedom and and he's in charge of, of uh, how it's all going to play out but it doesn't have to be preset of one move next move next move you know just in one set order. Right, right. Well, Philip Hamilton on the side chat here, I told you I'd get some questions in or maybe com comments, is saying, but the opponent has to ask permission to do any move. H how would you respond to that? Does does the opponent have to get permission every time they think, <laughs> every time they uh, act? Uh, no, you know, no. Ma God, maybe is God is um, omnipresent, so he's observing all the thoughts that are going on, and, and, and the, the person is thinking, okay, I'm going to move here next. And and God, taking the chessboard analogy out of the out of play, you know, uh, because it, we're not playing games. <laughs> yeah, of <laughs> course. Real yeah. Life. yeah, it's real life, right? God, God is powerful enough to actually change a person's mind, not to do evil, All right? But to do good. But God is also powerful enough to say, "Okay, I see what he's thinking. I'm going to let him do that thought that he's thinking, uh, even if it's a sin." And I'm powerful enough to work with that to accomplish the ends that I have declared will be accomplished unconditionally. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, Peter Fox makes the, a good statement. He says, God declares the end, and we trust that he will bring it about. Exactly. Um, that, that's what faith is all about. He has declared his victory, and we trust by faith that he's going to bring about what he promises to bring about. Um, and, and that's that's very much true within provisionistic theology is that we do believe he's declared the end, his victory, but we don't have to. I don't think there's any philosophical or logical or theological reason for us to have to adopt theistic determinism 
in order to believe that God will bring about his end results. Um, and that's the point we're making. And there doesn't seem to be anything in this passage in particular that says otherwise. Right, Brian? Yeah. In fact, I look forward to meeting Isaiah and, and saying, hey, Isaiah, what, what were you really thinking about when you said the end from ancient times? Because my, my mm-hmm. guess right now, I'm still leaning towards the Enoch prophecy. Because <laughs> right, right. Enoch lived in ancient times. And Enoch declared, according to Jude, uh, verse 14, he declared the end uh, from from that time period of the ancient times. He declared that what the end would look like. Right. Yeah. And, and if you read back, I mean, through the context here, he's obviously talking about false gods um, to whom will liken to me and make me equal and compare me uh, that we may be alike. Those who lavish gold from the purse and weigh out silver on the scales, hire a goldsmith and make it into a gold, a God, and they fall down and worship. In other words, he's talking about worshiping a false idol made of gold here. And he, he's, he's, he's rebuking idol worship, obviously, is what is the context of this verse. And it says they lift it onto their shoulders. They carry it. They set it in its place, and it stands there. It cannot move from its place. In other words, he's kind of mocking this. This God can't even move. They have to carry it around. Uh, and and they're worshiping it. Uh, if if one cries out to it, it does not answer or save them from his trouble. Unlike our God, by the way, when you do cry out to our God, He will answer and save you from His trouble. Not not the golden images, however. And then verse eight: Remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old. So there there goes to your. Uh, your comment about ancient things as well. So he's saying, remember the former things. In other words, think back over the scriptures and the things that we've learned over the years about God. For I am God and there is no other. So he's again, he's making the the rebuke of any other false gods that people are creating. That's the context. I am God and there is none like me declaring the end from the beginning. So what's the difference between the gold uh, idol that they have created and our God? Well, our God can prophesy about things that are coming that he's going to determine to bring about. He can declare an end from the beginning, and it actually happens. We can talk about the Messiah in Isaiah, describing him uh, very clearly in Isaiah, and then that actually can come about as as something throughout time. And that that is different than a golden idol who can't do, it can't even move from where it's from, much less declare the end from the beginning, much less declare prophecies. Yeah, I was wrong. I think I mentioned earlier um, that it could he could be talking about the Babylonian captivity. He's actually talking about the return from the Babylonian captivity under Cyrus. And if you recall, Isaiah is prophesying in around 700 BC. And so there's another 150 years before they even go into captivity and come back. Um, hmm. And so he's declaring the end of, of this return back. Yeah, you kind of, kind of freezing up on a skin, so I'm going to jump right in, and I'm going to move us to the next passage, Brian. Um, and the, the next passage that you sent me on your list is one I yeah. know we've talked about several times, uh, and I know Brian has Brian and I both have done a broadcast on Ephesians and inter, interacting with uh, uh, John Piper, in fact, um, because uh, he did a broadcast on Ephesians 1, and Brian and I did a response video going through Ephesians 1. So if you want to go back and listen to that, you can get some more detail. But um, I, I wanted to, to deal with especially Ephesians 1.11. Um, and, and I think Brian is back now because he's moving again. So, uh, yes, I'm moving so we'll, again. We'll, Sorry about that. <laughs> that's all right. But um, it, it says, it says uh, in, in Romans 1.11, is probably one of the most cited New Testament passages, if nothing else, uh, for theistic determinism. And, um, and it, just going back to verse 9, he says, He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him, with a view to administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth in him also. We have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. And so the real focus is um, according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. And so so many times theistic determinists 
will say, well, look, see, it says he works all things after the counsel of his will. Therefore, that means he sovereignly and unchangeably decreed everything that would happen before the foundation of the world. Um, and does this verse say that? Yeah, and that, that's the problem. Again, the, the before the foundation of the world is not in this verse. They have to borrow it maybe from verse 4. Um, right. But, but also, all things is in this verse. So this makes it a stronger verse for their argument, you know, all things. Uh, but the past tense idea before the foundation of the world is really the, 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 one of the niggly points. Um, mm. And so here's, here's how I look at this verse as a grammatically possible understanding based on the context. In fact, the context, as you just read, is really a future look, isn't it? It's a, it's yep. this, these are things that are going to happen in the future because God has purposed the, these ends, the, this this inheritance to to those that mm -hmm. that are in Christ. Um, so it's not really trying. Paul's not really trying to teach what happened before the foundation of the world. Those those things have to be read into the the words predestined or purpose or counsel. So so. He, Listen, listen to what I'm going to read here and see if this doesn't fit the context grammatically as well as contextually here. Um, in him also we have obtained when we were placed in him. In other words, when did we obtain this inheritance? We obtained it when we were placed in Christ, having hmm. uh, being predestined for that inheritance at that same moment that we were placed in in Christ through faith, according to the purpose, which when you read about God's purpose in the Bible, you see that it has conditional elements in it and it has unconditional elements in it. So you can't, you can't say the word purpose proves the idea of a decree of everything right, right. working out only one way. It, you're, you're putting too much on that word when you do a word study of that word. Right. Because I could have works, a purpose. I could have a purpose entering into a, a chess exactly. match or an event or a game. I can have a purpose and I could even have more power or more ability than everybody else involved in that exactly. particular event. Or I can go on a family trip and I can say, Hey, uh, we're going to go to this destination as a family and, and uh, no veto votes uh, 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 is where we're heading. Yeah. And we're going to make these various stops. But now you decide where are we going to eat? Uh, what are some of the other things you want to do? And, and, and the trip, is open has some open elements in it, and that's right. per, that's my purpose as the father. I want those yeah. open. I want those open it, elements. Yeah, it's what I it's what I referred to as kind of packing packing the word with a bunch of bag, theological baggage. Exactly. Uh, and 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 all theologians can do this. I'm not trying to say. And that I'm doing Calvinist. it right now. I'm, yeah, I'm just saying this. This is possible. And if you do a word study, I think my the word study will prove my idea that his purpose has conditional elements and unconditional elements instead of just only unconditional. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I've always seen Ephesians 111 as uh, kind of a parallel with, with Romans eight twenty eight. Would, would you yeah. agree with that? Um, yeah. B because it, it talks about God working presently, actively, Present tense, right? Mm -hmm. Presently, actively working all things together for good for those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. Right. And so, it's not saying He determines everything; it's saying that He works all things together for the good of His people. Um, and He doesn't that, work sin; He doesn't cause sin. I mean, I know there are Calvinists out there who do believe He causes sin. Um, yeah. but man, that you're, you are really slandering his righteous character. If you're saying he caused, he works sin according yeah. to the counsel of his will. Yeah. Uh, there, no, there's a, doesn't. there's a, uh, article online by John MacArthur and, and sometimes, you know, MacArthur says things that I agree with. And so I like to use him whenever I can, but, um, he actually talks about, you can see there it's Romans eight twenty eight. Um, he says, God's role with regard to evil is never as its author. And we would all say, amen. He simply permits, and, and this this flies in the face of what uh, John Calvin taught, and it seems to be contrary to the, the sovereign decree concept, but he simply permits evil agents to work, then overrules evil for his own wise and holy ends, 
Ultimately, he is able to make all things, including all the fruits of all evil of all time, work together for a greater good. And to that, I would say, amen. I, I, yeah, I think that's agree. exactly what, the way Roman, uh, Ephesians 1.11 would be interpreted, that God is presently actively taking all the fruits of all evil and, and working together for redemption, for, uh, to, to bring, uh, as uh, N.T. Wright puts it, to bring all things to rights. Uh, he puts everything right, uh, makes it all right. Um, in other words, no one's going to mock God that you will reap what you sow. God will bring justice where justice is due, um, and, and everything will be made right. But he's doing that presently and actively in our, in our world, according to both Ephesians 1.11, it's in the present active, and in uh, Romans uh, eight twenty eight, it's presently actively, um, and you have to you have to push Calvinists to be honest uh, when they when they use words like predestines, they put it in the present tense, or decrees, or determines. They use the present tense, and they really don't have justification to do that. You have to say to them, no, you mean decreed, right? You mean predestined before creation. And even this idea of permission, God doesn't permit. He he permitted for some, however that works, because you can't permit, you can't give permission to somebody that doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but somehow in their view, they he permitted man to sin before the creation yeah. of the world. And and that fall of man that happened before the creation of the world, he, he, he then made his decisions of what to do next. Well, and even uh, John Piper in his new book called Providence, the big red book that we've, we've talked about, I thought it was over here, but it's actually on my bookshelf now. But, but he, he actually changes his vernacular from some of his broadcast and earlier writings that I've interjected in his, this book. He takes a softer, kind of a softer a word. And he says, God has decreed to permit. Yeah. And so that's the way they kind of get around it is that God decreed before the foundation of the world to permit this to happen. Right. And uh, in, in other words, he decrees that this is going to take place, but he, he's presently actively bringing about that which he decreed before the foundation of the world. Um, and again, you're reading, that's I suggest Jesus as far as I can tell, because you're reading all of that baggage into these words. These you words are. never actually say that. And that's, that's what we're pointing out. Yeah, how can you how can you decree before creation to permit me to do something I have to do or permit himself? That's basically I mean, what I, he's saying. I, I have yeah. to do what quote I'm permitted to do. <laughs> what I'm permitted to do, I have to do it because I've been decreed to, that to that's do it. the only alternative for my will, um, and the, and the fall of mankind was decreed. So it's all coming out of that fall, and and God is permitting it all to play out. Um, based upon a decree. I mean, you, you can't get away from the Molinist can't and, and the Armenian can't. You can't get away from yeah. the idea that the decree sets in motion everything working out only one way. And, and what does it mean to permit yourself? Because, he, he, I mean, Piper's literally talking about he, he decrees to permit this yeah. to happen. And so you're decreeing for yourself to permit for another agent to do something freely? Right. Or are you permitting them to do something they were determined to do by the decree? Yeah, and that's that's where you, it, it's like when the Calvinist appeal to, oh well, you're you know you're free as long as you're doing what you want. Well, right. why do you want what you want on Calvinism? Well, you want what you want on Calvinism because of the decree. God decreed what you will want and and your nature, and He is yeah. just as much in sovereign control over your nature from your first birth as He is over your nature from your second birth. And so trying to distinguish between them as if there's a distinction with a difference makes us just go, huh? Um, yes. wh wh why are you giving God all the glory and the credit for the, the, the nature of man after their second birth while not acknowledging the nature of man from their first birth as being equally under the sovereign decree of God with people having absolutely no control over their hatred for and rejection of the gospel? Mm -hmm. and, and that's where they remove, in our estimation, the blameworthiness of the sinner and 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 ultimately undermine in our estimation the character and the goodness of God as well as his well meant offer of of the appeal of the gospel. And so um again me, anything more about this verse. Illustration. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, let me give an illustration. Um the rest of the verse here, you know, it's to, according to the council, and that word really does mean plan, but plans like we use the illustration of the trip of the family, you know, plans can have open aspects to them. And the word will at the end is actually the word desire. And we know he's he's spoken what his desire is. 
that yeah. all men be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. So, so the, the plan has to have that in mind if it's going to be according to his desire. Uh, but let me give you another illustration using the word will <clears throat> as we think of it in terms of uh, the human will that, that is made by a, a, a father uh, of his estate and, and he gets that will made before he dies and, and he puts in that will uh, all the um, inheritance factors that, that he wants to distribute of, of, his, of, of what he's accumulated. And, and can you picture him doing this before he has any children? Mm -hmm. And so he, he puts in the will that I'm going to distribute these inheritances um, to the firstborn. And, and I'm going to give it a co-heir a co inheritance portion to all my other children as well, you know. Um, <clears throat> now, the firstborn already exists, right? That's Jesus. Yeah. But the other children haven't been born yet and, and haven't been or adopted into the family yet. And yet they're in the will. Generally speaking, we, talk, we, we call it corporate election, right? Right, right. But then after they're born into the family or after they're adopted into the family through faith, which is the scripture points that out, it, it's you're put into the family through faith. Right. Then I can look at my sister or my brother and I can say, hey, we've we've been predestined to get this inheritance. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and we were predestined before I was even born. Before. Uh, but it wasn't like I was thought of as an individual back then. It's, it's right. the fact that. God set up the plan, and now I'm part of that plan. It, wasn't it you, Brian, I think, that brought up before even like the Levitical line of the Levites? Yeah. David, Talk about David, that because I think that makes sense too. Yeah, in First uh, Chronicles uh, 15, I think it is, David was bringing the ark back to Jerusalem. And if you remember, uh, failed the first time. <laughs> yeah. Put it on a cart. And then, and then he said, uh, the Levites need to carry the ark, for they were chosen to be priests before God forever. And, and so he uses the word chosen there. And, of course, we know when that choice took place. It took place in Aaron back at Mount Sinai. But in David's day, any Levite could look at another Levite and say, hey, we were chosen to carry the ark today. You know, we're chosen to be priests before God forever. And they're not thinking that their name was on some kind of list <laughs> back at Mount Sinai. Um, yeah. They're thinking we have this privilege because we're in the family. So and, before and they were ever, before the Levite person born under the lineage of Levi was even born, you could say he was predestined to serve this purpose as a, yes. as a Levite priest. Um, that doesn't mean everybody who was born under the lineage of Levi became a priest. We all know that. But what it means is that you could say we were set apart for this. This was yes. destined for us, if you will. This was predetermined for us without it necessarily talking about an individual being predetermined and to become individual. this thing. Right, right. They became um, an individual through, through birth. We become the yeah. individual that's predestined. Yeah, you you've yeah, frozen just a that. little bit there. You're you're kind of coming through. So let me let me introduce the next verse. We're about halfway through our hour mark, and we've gotten the first two of the four. So we're okay. on track. We're doing well here, and so let's go to Psalm one thirty nine. Hey, this is the good. third the third verse that you sent to me. Um, Psalm one thirty nine, verse sixteen is what we have marked here. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance. Psalm 139 is something I memorized back when I was in college, and uh, and I memorized it in a different translation. So this is it's hard to read something you've memorized in another way, but your eyes have seen my you unformed bring it up substance. On the oh, 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 so, yeah. Sorry about that. Thank you for the reminder. Uh, your eyes That's have right. seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all written and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me when as yet they were not one of them. Brian, does that prove yeah. theistic determinism? Yeah. So again, the word decree isn't in here. Uh, all things isn't in here. Uh, and that's what happens a lot of times with, with Calvinism or, or any, the any theology that's trying to prove itself from proof texts 
is they read into verses more than that that's there and uh, they say well this is an example and so all the other examples fit too um but no here here we have this example of of the substance and we have a book things being written and then we have the word days ordained i don't like the word ordained this is the new american standard i see um it's actually the same word the word here ordained is actually the same word that's translated formed like a potter forms of clay <laughs> so it's kind of interesting yeah. that they what's what's I'm the just curious said? yeah i'm just curious what the esv there you go. The ESV is, yeah. is more yeah. literal there there you go right days um, formed me because ordained is is a theological word that's that's filled right. with with uh, understanding there um and, and I also point out that you don't want to try to get your dogma, theological dogma, from poetry. It's yeah. just poetry of its very nature is, has subjective choices that need to be made. And this verse has a lot of choices that need to be made. For instance, is, is the, what's being written in the book? Is it the unformed substance that's being written in the book? Or is it the days being written in the book? Hmm. And so we, we look at the every one of them. So every one of them is what's being written in the book. Every one of what? What is the them? And usually them is a is a pronoun that you, you would look, look for and a seed of the pronoun. Yeah, you're, you're, you're kind of breaking up there. For, yeah, kind of breaking up there again, Brian. So I'm, I'm going to jump in real quick and just say, that yeah i think that the my frame not hidden from you made in secret That's i mean uh, obviously the passage you know the, you know the passage really gets into a poetic you know flow uh, precious to me your thoughts number of sands on the seashore uh you know it, it's very very poetic but also but the passage the fact is about that, being formed in the womb and and the calvin even right. says that what's written in the book are the parts of of the person's body that are being intricately woven together in, in the womb. Right. And even if you give the benefit of the doubt, again, we try to do that. Even if he's talking about these days, these days were written in your, your book. Um, you, you have other defeaters that aren't deterministic. In other words, God's not determining every thought action indeed you do during those days. Um, it, it could be based upon God's knowledge, future knowledge of what you're going to choose to do. It could be based upon um, the the numbers of days being uh, ordained, if you will, or f fixed, if you will. Even if you would say that that God knows how many days you will actually live, even though He's not the one determining the number of days you actually live. Um, and and so there's other ways in which you might deal with that text that don't de, 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 don't go so far as to prove omnideterminism. Or or it could also be that God has a perfect plan that He has for your life. But he's not saying, I'm not going to give you an opportunity to say no to any parts of that plan. And at yeah. the end of your life, we will we will compare what I had planned for it and what it, how it ended up. Um, and because yeah. I, I gave you that freedom to interact with what I had planned and you you went with some of it and, and you went against some of it. Yeah. Uh, so this, the poetry allows for all of that. Um, and let me just throw in here some weeds, if you don't mind. Sure. <laughs> the, the, the Septuagint, which is the, he, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, uh, the old, old translation that, that the Christians actually was kind of their popular translation uh, during the first centuries of Christianity. This is how it reads. Thine eyes saw my unwrought substance, and all men shall be written in thy book. They shall be formed by day, though there should for a time be no one among them. <laughs> so, wow. so now you can imagine, this is the common Bible of the Christians, and they're reading this verse, and they're not getting what we're reading from our English verse here. Um, in fact, the, the, the uh, Hebrew really supports the idea of a, a future tense, um, will be written. Uh, mm -hmm in in uh instead of were written 
Right. It's, it's right. a Nafal. It's a Nafal PL uh, imperfect, and it's not a consecutive. So it's actually it's actually if you the more I again the more common idea is the future tense idea. Right. Um, right. Just like the the them points back to substance more than it would point forward to days. A cataphoric is the grammatical term for for a pronoun looking for a uh, reference after it comes into play instead of before. Right, it right. Comes into play. Yeah. Let's look at the last last passage out of Lamentations. Uh, you got Lamentations three. Uh, I'll start at verse 36, to defraud a man, well, even go back to 35, to deprive a man of justice in the presence of the Most High, to defraud a man his lawsuit of these things the Lord does not approve. Who is there who speaks and it comes to pass unless the Lord has commanded it? Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that both good and ill go forth? Does this teach theistic determinism, Brian? Well, no, <laughs> we're done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, again, the word before creation is not here. Uh, everything is kind of hinted at in the sense it's talking about everything that man does or man decides to do, you know, has right. spoken, who has spoken, meaning what man has spoken something and right. it came to pass without God. And, and we can use the word permit here, you know, God commanding it or God permitting it to actually take place because he has to make the final decision. I have no problem with the providence of God, uh, right. including a determinism um, that is active. Um, and he's still determining things that he's going to cause and permit. He never causes sin and, and he does permit sin, but he's working right. these things together for good. Back up to verse thirty one okay to get the context here a little bit more for the lord will not cast off forever but though he cause grief he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love for he does not afflict from his heart or grieve the children of men so so even though verse 38 um how, you go back to verse 38 is it not from the mouth of the most high that good and bad come uh those two last words good and bad we we think of moral good and we think of moral bad but actually mm -hmm. the, the hebrew there has the idea more of life circumstances <laughs> yeah that, that, that are uh subjectively good subjectively bad more than the moral idea and we just read right. earlier then that god is not cause he's not out to try to cause grief yeah. he's out to actually bring compassion opportunities to man yeah he's a redeemer of, of the evil and the suffering that's caused by the fall yes. and sinful man and interestingly uh again i like to refer to macarthur when it helps because some people may not listen to the quote unquote anti-Calvinist Leighton Flowers and Brian Wagner, but they might listen to MacArthur because he's a little bit more, uh, you know, on their side of things with regard to these things. But um, when when uh, he's brought up this question, is God responsible for evil? And he says, no scripture says that when God finished his creation, he saw everything and declared it very good. Many scriptures affirm that God is not the author of evil. God cannot be tempted by evil and he himself does not tempt anyone. God is light. Uh, I hate when that happens. They have these um, pop-ups. God is the author. God is not the author of confusion. And if that is true, he cannot in any way be the author of evil. Occasionally someone will quote passages like Isaiah 45, seven and claim it proves by the way, Isaiah 45, seven is I form the light. I create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord do these things. And so some people interpret that, uh, in a deterministic way, but notice what, what MacArthur even goes on to say, and they claim it proves God, God made evil as a part of his creation. I form the light, I create darkness, I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do these things. But the New American Standard Bible gives a sense of Isaiah 46, 6 through 7 more clearly. There is no one besides me, beside me. I am the Lord and there is no other. No one forming light and creating darkness, causing the one forming lightning, light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating calamity. I am the Lord who does all these. In other words, God devises calamity as judgment for the wicked, 
but in no sense is the author of evil. Uh, evil originates not from God, but from the fallen creature. And so I'm just pointing out that there are moderate Calvinists who even take some of these proof texts used to support theistic determinism and don't interpret them so highly, so to speak, as to support the concept that God literally determines uh, moral evil in that way. Now, in my estimation, this was written uh, back in the 90s from MacArthur. It seems as if MacArthur has become more and more Calvinistic over the years. Less, He was a, much more of a, sounded a lot like a Southern Baptist dispensationalist <laughs> back when I knew of him, you know, the, listened to his stuff from the 80s. But the, the older he's gotten and the more he's surrounded himself with the Together for the Gospel, John Piper, Sproul types, it seems that he's become more and more within the Calvinistic framework of of theology. At least that's been my experience with. with well, he start he MacArthur. started a seminary, and and uh, and so all the textbooks <laughs> that are normally used, um, all the commentaries that would be um, put on the shelves, uh, not all, of course, but most, would have a reformed theology view. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And so what else do we want to say about this text that kind of gives us indication of what the author may be intending? So, yeah, I mean, it, I always say to students, you know, look at why is the book being written? Uh, if there's a difficult passage, it has to fit the purpose of the book somehow. And so Lamentations is written as a, a lament, right, of the right. fall of Jerusalem. And, uh, and yet in the middle of, of this lament, in this middle chapter, um, he's saying, look, God is allowing these things, or God is causing these things. If, if man speaks it and it comes to pass, Nebuchadnezzar says, I'm going to destroy Jerusalem, uh, and, and it comes to pass. Well, it's not because Nebuchadnezzar, it's because God allowed it to come to pass. Um, but his mercy, it's all because he's trying to provide mercy. In fact, when when um, when um, John MacArthur talked about the the calamity being to bring judgment on mankind, my view is physical judgment that falls upon mankind is never a payment for sin. Sin is only paid for on the cross or in hell, and so judgment that falls on mankind during their lifetime. Uh, is for the purpose of of getting them to repent. Getting it's it's a it's actually a merciful act. It's getting you to wake up and and humble yourself before it's too late. I, I personally yeah. even think um, when 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 the death judgment falls, you know, when when like the flood was taking place in in the Genesis, God had given 120 years of preaching righteousness through Noah. And I think, I personally think we're going to find people in heaven who, when the rain started falling, it was God saying, Hey, Noah was right. Wasn't he? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it, I, I always describe wrath, you know, as God removing his hand of protection, you know, that like allowing somebody to, uh, to, to continue in their ways and then say, okay, look at the natural results of the things that happen to those who continue to go down that path. Um, and so, you know, wrath is allowing in a lot of ways uh, for objects of his affection to experience the results of their sin so as to like to get to the pigsty of their life so that they'll see the error of their ways, much like a parent might allow their son or their daughter to go out and do the thing that they do in sin, even though they don't want them to. They say, well, you know, I'm, I can f lock you in your bedroom and keep you from doing that. Um, you know, I can withhold your inheritance so you don't have any funds to do that. I, I don't have to let you go. I can, I, can, I can overpower you if I have to. Or in grace, I can cut you off so that I may save your soul, as the as Paul said to the, the you know the Corinthian uh, church, the sinners, warn them once, warn them twice, and then cut them off at, from the church, from the protection of the church. Let them go out on their the, the, their own ways, so that you may may lead to their salvation. This is hope, and so I, I think that's a perfect example 
of the mercy and grace of God. This is one of the reasons I emphasize that so much through Romans 9 through 11, because it's exactly what he's doing to Israel as a whole. He's, they've become callous due to their own rebellion, free rebellion, just like Pharaoh, he freely rebels. And then eventually, because of an act of judgment, he hardens them in the rebellion to bring about redemption through them. But it's all for the sake of mercy. Uh, I've Amen. bound them all over to disobedience so they may have mercy on them all so that they might provoke them to envy through the salvation of the Gentiles, that they may return and leave their unbelief and be grafted back in. That doesn't sound like a reprobate of Calvinism. It sounds like somebody who's praying for and holding out hope for. And he's doing what he's cutting them off and showing that kind of judgment and wrath mercifully. That is actually a merciful thing. And so that, that's something that I'm really glad that you highlighted from that, that passage. Yeah, and let me just finish with, you know, Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. He is not willing. The word willing there is actually our word for determination. He has mm -hmm. not determined anyone to perish without having them have first an opportunity to come to repentance. That's really what the verse is talking about. And he's long-suffering. Yeah waiting for them to take that opportunity that he gives to everybody. Everybody has a sufficient opportunity once or twice or three mm -hmm. times in their life to seek yeah. God and his mercy. Yeah. And that's what he's determined. That's his, that's his predetermination yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. that he's made for mankind. Well, and, and we are, we've only dealt with the Calvinistic proof text. We obviously have a ton of proof texts on our side that seem to fly in the face of the Calvinistic understanding. Many of you are very familiar with the, uh, Jeremiah 19.5, for example, when they're building the high places of Baal to burn their sons in the fire as burnt offerings to Baal. He says, which I did not command nor decree, nor did it come into my mind. Um, you know, that kind of text is, a, a, and there's other texts that are parallel to that one, in fact, saying the same thing. Sure. That this is not something God just, wanted just to happen. Just look at the word determined. Just yeah, just look at the word choice or decision or determine that's used for God. And you see all these verses where he's making decisions after creation. So so they couldn't have all been before creation if God's word, own word says, I'm making this decision now. Um, yeah. In fact, there's some verses where he says, I've never decided this before, and I'm, make, I'm making this decision now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the 1 John 2, uh, 16 that I've mentioned for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. In other words, all moral evil, moral sin, because everything's rooted in pride and lust. I mean, that, that kind of covers mm. all the moral sins of all times. That is, it is not from the Father. So the whole purpose of this verse is to show that the origin is not from the Father. And yet Calvinism right. says that sovereign, the sovereign decree is the origin of all things. Ultimately, yeah. is that the reason all things come to pass is by the sovereign decree. And it's not just God knowing it and permitting it. Calvinists, even in their confessions, say that's not what's happening. And, and I don't know how you can consistently say something is not from the Father, but then say that the Father sovereignly and unchangeably uh, decreed it to come to pass before the foundation of the world. I, I don't, that's A equals not A in my mind, at least. Uh, I don't know, Brian, you're usually pretty good about uh, being able to to read what the other side means or how they can or justify their meaning. Um, but And I try to do that too. I'm, I'm try, I try to, to steel man my opponent, but I honestly ca cannot even fathom how um, how somebody can go to a verse like this. Not from and, the Father, and, right? Yeah, and see it's not, it's not from the Father. And uh, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. Uh, and there's so many verses like that. I, Jeremiah 18 was probably one of the main passages that helped me uh, jettison the idea of determinism. Uh, you have the potter clay illustration. And, and so what is the potter doing? He is forming the clay according to what? A plan, a plan that he has in his mind that he wants that pot to be, right? That yeah. plan does not include God saying or the potter saying, okay, after three minutes, I'm going to mar this vessel on purpose. <laughs> yeah. You know, no, it, it just, it, yeah, it, it does not make any he, sense. He's working with the clay and the clay is responding to his working. And the, and the, and the, the idea is the clay has a choice. And, and the rest of the 11 verses there show that but you have a choice. And God is making a plan, and you can respond to it. And if you don't, mm -hmm. he, he can make another plan. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because yeah. he, 
he has that sovereign oversight of the whole thing as it, uh, seems, as it seems good to him. Yeah, Burke, Burke Hamlin, thank you for your super chat. Hebrews eleven six, and really the whole chapter sh- skewers Calvinism to me. <laughs> and for those that don't know, Hebrews eleven six is it's the passage that talks about it's impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who sincerely seek Him. And then, of course, the the uh, ch- chapter eleven is full of just verse after verse after verse of people who believed, even from Rahab the harlot who had no education, very likely illiterate. Um, and, and she fears the God of Israel, hides the spies, and she makes the hall of faith. And there's all kinds of stories like that that, that do, in, in my estimation, also seem to fly in the face of some of the claims of, of the Calvinistic system. Um, yeah. There's another, there was somebody else above, I, I, I can't find you now, sorry, uh, but you asked, has Daniel 4.35 come up? Um, that was one of the seven that I picked out for today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we, we decided to narrow it down to four, but um, because he brought it up in the side chat, let me just read it. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say to him, why have you done or why dost thou? Um, do you want to comment on that one, Brian, just briefly? I mean, it, it falls right in line with the other ones that we've already covered, but yeah, it, it's not it. ever. It doesn't say anything about a decree of everything before the foundation of the world. But let me just throw this in here. This is Nebuchadnezzar. The whole chapter is really his testimony, and nowhere in the whole chapter, this is the question you have to ask yourself: Is Nebuchadnezzar really a believer? Hmm. Daniel's recording his testimony. There's no doubt about it. But is he? A te- is it a testimony of someone who's actually chosen Yahweh to be? his God. He never says Yahweh is my God. Right. right. He calls it Daniel's God. <laughs> yeah. And then the other thing is there's some, there's definitely uh, manuscript problems here. Uh, you read the, the Septuagint's translation of this um, very unclear of what's being said here. Uh, I think the bigger problem is, is this idea of, of a, that God is trying to say the inhabitants are reputed as nothing. That, that, to me, that's a problem right there. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar's opinion of, of what God thinks of mankind, that, that man thinks that God thinks mankind is nothing. Well, we're created in his image. He does not think we are nothing. Hmm. So I, I, I don't think we should use Nebuchadnezzar's words to prove doctrine any more than I think we should use satan's words to prove that jesus is god you know <laughs> or yeah, the demon yeah. the demon shouting out uh that you're the son of god it's it's like one time i was on twitter and and i was asking for a proof text for, the, for something they said and they quoted from one of uh job's uh interlocutors you know one of job's accusers uh who got rebuked later for for their accusations and i was like i don't know that that's the best person to quote from you know that that's kind exactly. of the worst case of proof texting and but even but, but the thing is, I always like to grant the Calvinist the benefit of the doubt and say, okay, what what even if we grant you this is a word from God directly, this is not a Nebuchadnezzar crying out something that's wrong. Maybe maybe this is under inspiration. And therefore, we'll say even even God speaks through donkeys. And let's just say Nebuchadnezzar is saying exactly what God wanted him to say, and it is true. Does this passage still reach the bar? Exactly. Um, and and it just doesn't. Um. To, to 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 state these things about God, uh, you know, uh, according to his will, the host of heaven, inhabitants of the earth, none can stay his hand. Do, do we think people can stay his hand? No. Do we do we think that he can he can be thwarted? Again, free will doesn't thwart anybody. If I give my child the permission to make a choice, even though I have the power to stop them, doesn't mean I, I've lost my power. It, it's my sovereign right as the father to grant my child that choice. Exactly. And if God chooses to allow humanity to have a, a limited amount of freedom, who's to stay his hand and say, why dost thou? You, you can't ask that question any more so than we can, uh, regardless of what perspective you're coming from. We can both say that to each other. Uh, can you stop his hand from granting creatures freedom of the will? No, you can't. Uh, and just like you can say to me, can you stop his hand if he chooses to control your will? No, <laughs> you can't. If God wants to squish you uh, like a big thumb and just you know squish it, he can't stop anybody who wants to stop. I mean, nobody's claiming otherwise. Um, and that that's sometimes what's baffling to me is when people read passages as if they address the point of contention, 
when really they're not addressing a point of contention at all. They're just stating something we all agree with, but yeah. they're reading, they're, they're putting a bunch more baggage on top of the verse to say something that uh, it, it never actually, actually And, and what this proves really, Leighton, is this happens with other theologies, not just, just uh, Calvinism. Man-made theologies has to find proof in Scripture if they want to call themselves a scriptural theology. And so they have their glasses of what they're trying to prove, and they read phrases in certain verses, and they say, there, oh, there it is, there it is, you know? <laughs> Confir because confirmation bias, yeah. Confirmation bias, because they, the phrase on, it, uh, in it, on its own or the verse on its own out of its context gives that feeling that it proves what I'm trying to prove. Yeah, and yeah, uh, you got to look at the context. You got to look at the grammar. You got to ask yourself: Was the author really trying to teach what you're trying to teach from this verse? Yeah. Well, in closing, we we come to our hour mark, and I and I I, I promise Brian we would try to stick around that time, and, and I'll, I prefer to stay under the hour when I can. And so let let's bring this to a close. But I, I wanted to end with a question from uh, Sammy Dennis. He asked this earlier, um, and it's a question I get probably the most asked question I get is something related to this question. Um, and it's usually from people from my side of the aisle. In other words, it's it's those who are non-Calvinist and, and sometimes very uh, vitriolic against Calvinism. Um, but he, he I think he's asking in good faith. And so I want to answer and may, Brian can can, I think, bring some balance to this, too. So I'm glad you're here for this. But he, but he asked, you say you post that video of the two atheists saying that they aren't Christians anymore. He's talking about Derek Webb video um, and because they haven't been chosen and they've been told a false doctrine and they're headed to hell if they do not repent. Let's, let's just pause there for a second. Um, I, I have posted that video. Matter of fact, I just got a message from somebody telling me that James White responded to that Derek Webb video and even reflects on meeting Derek Webb and talks about this whole situation. There is so much cognitive dissonance statements. Um, ignoring the elephant of determinism in the room when he's answering this 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 quandary. Uh, I will do a video on it probably in the next couple of days because uh, it is it is amazing at how James White doesn't seem to even recognize. He even talks about get, uh, Derek White, Webb. Well, it looks like Derek Webb has been given over to his sin. Given over, he's, if he's a reprobate, he, he talks about maybe he's not elect. And even he admits maybe he's not elect. And then later he says he's been given over. How do you give something somebody over to something they were born as? You, you, it doesn't, and the statements you'll hear him make, and he seems to kind of ping pong back and forth, um, sounding like a provisionist in one statement and then, a, a, then acknowledging Calvinism in the next. It is, it is absolutely baffling to listen to James White deal with Derek Webb's deconstruction and, and what he says about it. It is, it is cognitive dissonant statement after cognitive dissonant statement. It's one of the most revealing uh, videos I've ever watched from a leading Calvinistic source showing the absolutely untenable nature of Calvinistic theology in light of a, of a, you know, a former Calvinist deconstructing quote unquote, leaving the faith um, and so stay tuned for that video. It's coming out. Um, and and I, I wanted to to mention that uh, before I move on to the, the rest of the question from Sammy. He says, um, how can you call these Calvinists, like James White or other Calvinists, our brothers and sisters, if they are literally leading people to hell, as you posted in that video multiple times? In other words, if, if their doctrines are leading to a, the very excuse that these uh, you know, former Calvinists are using to abrogate their responsibility to trust and, and humble themselves and repent. If it's true, this doctrine can be causing some people to turn away from the faith altogether, then why not just come right out and call Calvinist heretics, say they're unsaved, they're just like every other cult in the world, and shout them down as, as exactly what they are? Um, that that kind of question formed in different ways, sometimes as harsh as I just put it, sometimes in a, in a softer language, is the most asked question that I get. After I get done speaking, I have people come up to me. The most asked question from the non-Calvinist, at least, is why in the world aren't you just calling these people heretic unbelievers? And, and, and why, why do you refer to them as brothers? Why do you talk kindly of John MacArthur? 
and John Piper? Why, why don't you cast them out? Um, and I've answered that question on multiple programs. I know Brian knows that. But I have Brian here, and sometimes hearing a different voice answer that question is helpful. And I don't honestly don't even know what he's going to say. It, it could be Brian comes out and say, "Oh no, they're all heretics and going to hell." You didn't know I knew that. I, I don't think that's I don't think that's what he's going to say. But um, I honestly, I, I Brian is uh, a, an older brother in the Lord, yeah. not much older. I mean, he he looks as, about I'm the same age older. as I do with my. <laughs> but but a wiser brother in the Lord for sure. And and I I would like you to answer that question for our listeners. If you, you know, I'm putting you on the spot. I, you had no idea I was going to ask no, you that question. No, I'm glad it's ending this way. Um, you know, we we have brothers and sisters in every denomination. I would think everyone would agree with that. Yeah. That when God looks down, He sees the heart of everyone, and He knows which ones in every denomination are trusting only in his son to save them from their sins and have give, have the gift of everlasting life. But also in every denomination are people who are telling us they are brothers and sisters in Christ. They might even be telling us that they're trusting in Jesus uh, as their savior. Hmm. And, and we can only go on that. We can only go on their profession of faith and call them brothers and sisters uh, if their faith is in the gospel, if their faith is in Jesus and not in some uh, man-made gospel, you know, not a false gospel that is, that is delineated as a false gospel. So taking, taking uh, first illustration of Roman Catholicism, there are brothers and sisters in Roman Catholicism in spite of the gospel that Roman Catholicism teaches as far as trusting priests, trusting sacraments to get grace through the sacraments yourself, and you're not really ever sure that you've got enough. <laughs> yeah. You probably have to pay some of your own. Yeah. Yet, let, let in spite of in, that Brian. false teaching, there are people in. The uh, sorry, you kind of froze up on when you start talking about the, the Catholic, some of the Catholic. Um, views you were kind of freezing up and i don't want people to, to miss that so um l let me just interject oh, sorry uh, a couple that. of comments while yeah you kind of while you're you're re rebooting there in a sense uh, I'll, I'll make a couple of comments from the side chat samuel carter says yeah that pressure to call them heretics doesn't help anyone and it doesn't change their mind at all that's not how you win people over regardless of how you think the state of their soul might be in other words, it, exactly. it doesn't work to just shout somebody down as a heretic, especially I didn't believe I, I lost my salvation when I was a Calvinist. I, I still was trusting in Christ for the salvation of my soul. I just misunderstood certain texts of Scripture and was advocating for those understand, that understanding of the text. And so I don't believe I was right. unredeemed when I was advocating for a false view. Uh, Derek, um, he makes a good point here. He says, I argue against Calvinism almost daily, but I still acknowledge them as brethren. And I will continue to. I will not throw them out of the body for it. I, in other words, he doesn't know the condition of each individual soul. Now, there may be some people he's contending against that aren't real true believers, and their fruit show it. And sometimes when you run up against a few like that, you begin to kind of lump them all together. It's a form of uh, kind of almost like racism or bigotry. You come across and, and you deal with a certain color of skin who treats you badly, and then you, you just lump everybody else together. Oh, anybody with that color skin must be bad because I had that experience with that one person with that color of skin. Um, same thing can happen. I came across a Calvinist who treated me badly. Therefore, all Calvinists must be that way. Um, I get it. I understand that feeling. But you've got to be careful to, uh, to, to not fall into that simplistic and I think erroneous way of thinking. Piper, I've met Piper. I've worked with Piper. He's been a part of our ministry. He's one of the most humble caring, kind individuals I've ever had the pleasure of working with. I disagree with him strongly. I've contended with a lot of his stuff on our program, but he even confronts mean Calvinists. He confronts them on his broadcast, calls them out, tells them they, they may not even be saved, he even says. Um, and so you've got, you've got to not just lump everybody into the same exact category uh, because they're just not all in the same category. Um, and, and I think that's what Brian is, is pointing out as well. But you, Brian, you were you were talking about Catholicism and some of the yeah, things that I we love, would stand against. Yeah, because I love people from Roman Catholic background. I, I lived in Ireland for 12 years, and you can't help but love 
Irish Catholics <laughs> living living there for 12 years. <clears throat> but I but I hated the harm that Catholicism was doing in pushing people away from really understanding the gospel. But there were people I met who who felt they were being loyal to Jesus by being loyal to Catholicism. But their faith was only in Jesus to save their souls. Mm-hmm. So so same with Calvinism. There, there, there are people in Calvinism, there are some who think it's the gospel. Well, automatically, that's a red flag. Well, if you think Calvinism is the gospel, that's a false gospel because Calvinism isn't the gospel. But there are some people who think they're being loyal to Jesus by being loyal to Calvinism. And and for me to try to help them away from that loyalty by by saying, well, you're not a brother, you're 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 lost when they when they profess that their faith is only in Jesus for the saving of their soul. Well, that's not going to help them uh, for me to push them away and say you're lost because you're a Calvinist. Yeah. If they're professing faith only in Jesus and they're professing Calvinism, which is harmful. Don't get me wrong. It is harmful. It's harmful to evangelism. It's harmful to prayer. It's harmful to the glory of God's own nature of righteousness. It's harmful to the um, uh, understanding of God's word in its clarity. Um But if I can tell by interacting that this person's trust is only in Jesus to save them from their sin, hey, they're my brother, and Mm. I should lay lay down my life for them and trying to win them back. Yeah. Um, Sammy does interact again, and maybe I'm misunderstanding his question. Maybe he's talking about, are we calling Derek Webb a brother? And and I'm not calling Derek Webb a brother. Uh, He's denying his belief in Christ, just like Tyler Vela. Um, I, I wouldn't call him a brother in Christ because he's denying his faith in Christ. So that's why he's saying you guys didn't answer my question, though. These guys aren't turning to Christ because they were told a lie. Um, they were told they can't by Calvinists. That's the entire point. They're going to hell because of a lie. Again, um, we, we're not calling Derek Webb or those who deny Christ a brother. So maybe that was your misunderstanding, Dennis, and maybe or my misunderstanding of your question. So, yeah, we're not we're not saying those who deny Christ faith in Christ. We're, we're not saying that they're, they're necessarily a brother. Let, let, me, let me, let me help Sammy out here. I think, um, it, it backs up to how did they become Christians to begin with? And I used right, the right. word, I used the word Christian with quotation marks. So, so when did they become professing of Christianity and not really trusting in Jesus? Cause my view is they never were saved. And so they professed Christianity. Maybe they were baptized into it as a child. Uh, maybe maybe they prayed a sinner's prayer and someone said after they prayed that prayer, hey, now you're a Christian. <laughs> and so they trusted that person's testimony instead of knowing what trusting Jesus was all about. And then they fell in love with Calvinism. And then they realized Calvinism presents a horrible view of God. <laughs> and, they, yeah. and they said, I don't want anything to do with that kind of Christianity. So in my view, they were never saved to begin with. Even though they professed Christianity, they really didn't profess the true gospel. And you have to deal with each of these, we call them apostates, you have to deal with each of them individually to find yeah. out where, what was their background, where were they coming from in terms right. of what were they trusting um, as, as the source of, of calling themselves a Christian. What were, yeah, and there's really, them? and I've talked about this in other programs, there's really only three possibilities that I can think of at least. Brian, you can add to this if you can think of any other possibilities. Either they're a backslidden Christian. In other words, like Tyler Vela, for example, he's denounced Christ, but maybe he'll come back around. Maybe Derek Webb will come back around. In, a, in other words, he's, he's in a backslidden state, truly was redeemed, but just going through doubts, going through issues, and he doesn't know how to express those things. Maybe rebellion, whatever. So it's either a backslidden Christian. Um, two, it, the possibility is never was saved in the first place. Those who have gone out from uh, um, among us were never of us, as you just explained it. That, that is another possibility. And the third possibility is that there is, uh, that he was born again and now he's, he's, he's lost and because of his uh, rebellion. Um, and that's the third possibility that's debated. In other words, there's some of us who don't believe that that category exists in Scripture, and there's only these two other categories, and there's some people who believe that all three categories exist. Okay, um, what's the difference in how we treat them? In other words, if, if they're denying Christ, if they're saying, I don't believe in Jesus for the remission of sins, we are all 
all of us, whether Calvinists, non-Calvinists, whether those who believe in eternal security or not, all of us are doing the exact same thing. We're calling them to repentance and faith because we can't see their heart. We have no idea of what their heart is. Um, we, we, we call them to faith because they're, denounce, they're, de, they're denying Christ. And so we're going to call them to believe and trust in Christ. And we're going to say, I don't know the condition of their heart with regard to those three things. Brian and I think it's probably one of these two things based upon what the scripture revelation tells us. And another person might say, well, it's one of these three things. But as far as what we know about the condition of their heart, we don't. Um, all we know is the fruit. God knows the root. And, and yeah. we have to call them out based upon the fruit of, of what they're showing us. And if they're showing us they don't believe in Christ, we're going to call them to faith and repentance. What we're not going to do is what some hyper once saved, always saved type folks do and just say, oh, he, he professed Christ earlier, so he's all right. don't worry about him. He's fine. He's <laughs> good. He, he got the once saved, always saved. He'll lose you know, some rewards maybe. Yeah, you know he's good. Don't don't worry. Don't worry too much about it. We're, I'm not going to ever do that. I, I don't think Brian is in that category either. No, in fact, um, in my view, I take him at his word. If he if he's rejecting Jesus as God, if he's rejecting Jesus as any kind of savior, I'm taking him at his word that that's what's in his heart. And and yeah. to me, he's lost. He's lost whether he whether he was saved and lost it or or he never had it. He's lost, and I'm taking him at his word. I think a backslidden or what I would call an immature Christian would never deny Jesus is God, would never deny, uh, now maybe under pressure of persecution or something they might, but I'm, I'm saying they would never deny in their heart that Jesus is God, Jesus is the only Savior. They may feel unsaved because they're immature and, and, and they don't understand the promises of Jesus yet fully, and, and they, they, they only see how sinful they feel because their flesh is still winning victories. But that's different than these two guys. These two guys are denying publicly, um, so they're not backslidden or immature. They're they're to me they're lost. Yeah. Um, again, I, I, Sammy's saying we still don't understand his point. Um, I, 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 and even <laughs> Sorry, Ed O'Leary, Ed O'Leary says I don't. Me, Sammy, and we can discuss uh, on yeah. Facebook, or I give you my email, and we can discuss by email. Yeah, Ed's saying, I, I don't think either one of you understand Sammy's point. And, uh, you know, sometimes when you read something online and you're not, you know, you're trying to read it quickly and respond live, you miss the point. And so maybe I'm missing Sammy's point here. While, while you were talking there, Brian, I usually like to listen to you, but I was actually rereading <laughs> his point just to see if I'm following it. And I, I, it sounds like he's asking, how, how can I call these Calvinists? Um, He's, you know, I thought can, he was how, saying, how, how can I call present day Calvinists? Yeah. Christians? How can you call these Calvinists our brothers and sisters if they are literally leading people to hell? As yeah. in that video you posted. And that's what we're so saying. Let me ask you They're, this, Sammy. Yeah. Do you think you can do anything in your in your walk with Jesus? Do you think you can do anything that would be such a harm to others watching you that they would reject Jesus Christ? It's right. So, like, for... let's say, let's say somebody catches you lying to uh, a, a, a coworker, right. um, or someone sees, you know, someone looking at porn that claims to be a pastor. Uh, it's happened recently in a situation that I'm aware of. Um, something like that happens, and that leads the person to abandon the faith because of that circumstance situation, the the Rabbi Zechariah situation, or something like that happens that. It has nothing to do with Calvinism. It has to do with their moral behavior, but it leads somebody uh, astray. It leads them to go a wrong direction. Does that mean that that person who did that sin, whatever it may be, that may have caused a, a young one to stumble, is is necessarily uh, unsaved themselves? Um, and that, that's the the point we're making is that uh, we don't we don't think that that necessarily because somebody's making an error that that person's necessarily unsaved. That that's the point we're making. Um, and so again, I, I, I've, I've addressed it the best I know how, and and we're getting we're getting long on our time here. So uh, we'll we'll end with Steve Jones. Thank you for your super chat, and and Brian, it is driving him nuts that your mirror is not centered over the dresser, and the background there. It, yeah, you you need you need to work. The OCD people are just absolutely <laughs> there. <laughs> there you go. There he is. He's getting up and moving it. Uh, I love it. <laughs> now my door won't open. Now my door won't open, but that's okay. 
<laughs> oh, it did, with, oh, it, it doesn't matter. You got to have your center. You got to have your mirror centered. <laughs> At least we end your... on a good note here for, for <laughs> yes. our brother Steve here. <laughs> yes, we don't want to leave anybody askew for sure. That may be <laughs> wanting to know that. So, um, again, Brian, thank you for for the time that you've uh, taken to be with us today. Thank you for your insight and and always, uh, I, I just thank you for the input you give on the the Facebook page. I know uh, you you. Uh, spend a lot of time responding to a lot of questions that I would never have time to give uh, give a word to, and I appreciate that about you. I feel you, I really feel job. my privilege. Uh, thank you for not not feeling like I'm I'm doing too much uh, that would harm your ministry. I think your ministry is fantastic. Praise the Lord for it. Um, honoring Jesus and what He's provided for us in His wonderful salvation. And so I'm glad to have this ministry with people. I'm trying to limit myself. Maybe sometimes I say to people, look, we've talked enough. (laughs) You can have the last word. You can have the last word. Um, But I think I think it is a ministry of people around the world that are are searching and there's more listening than on Facebook. You know, you're interacting, but but there are a lot of people reading that you don't even know that are there. Yeah, absolutely. And so that's why we should show forth Christ in our responses and 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 realize that there's a there's a multitude out there that are being helped yeah. to work through these issues. These issues have been around for centuries and will will yeah. continue to be around for centuries more. Um, but we have a wonderful Savior and a wonderful salvation that He provides for everybody. Amen. Yeah. And and and, uh, and uh, well said, Brian. And and for those that are looking for resources, if you're looking for live interaction. The Twitter and Facebook pages are great places to go. That it, it's not always nice. It's not always kind. I can't control everybody's behavior, but it's a place where you can go and try to give answers. Brian, if you see Brian Wagner's name on there, you know you're going to give get a, a good uh, answer without divisiveness, and that's going to try to help to help. It's going to he's going to strive to understand you before he engages with you. And so I appreciate that about Brian. And for those looking for other resources, Sociology101.com, you can find a lot of resources there. Of course, my book, The Potter's Promise, gives a, a, a defense of traditional or provisionistic sociology, my journey in and out of Calvinism. It goes over Romans 9, John 6, Ephesians 1, most especially. And of course, a positive presentation for God's provision for all, a defense of God's goodness, that God's good, not just because we we say he's good, he's good because uh He's demonstrably good. He is re- recognizably good. Amen. We don't just say it because we, we're afraid he's going to smite us if we don't. We we believe him to be good. Yeah, Brian. <laughs> can I can I get it, put a little commercial in there for the school that I teach for uh, Veritas Baptist Absolutely. College? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, it's it's all online. You can get a great education up through. Um, in fact, we're adding on a doctor of ministry degree this fall. Um, but you can get also get a, a ministry of uh, masters of education if you're teaching at a Christian school and the, and we're credited with Tracks Association, um, and we we have some good teachers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and all the rest of his and all the rest of the teachers. Yeah, no, we have great me? we have great teachers in spite of some, and yeah. um, and uh, the Lord and they most of the men uh, in have have pastoral experience of, of 10, 10 years even more. Yeah, um, that, that are teaching. Yeah. That's great. And yeah, I, I, my, maybe I could say the same about Trinity either. I, I don't know all the professors <laughs> at Trinity where I teach, but, um, but all the ones I know I've enjoyed being working with. So that's a, that's a good thing. But yeah. let me encourage you now, uh, go now, share Christ and show love. God bless. Yeah.